Good morning, everyone, and thanks for being here and tuning in. Today, we'll have a situational update from Deputy Commissioner Batesy, a transportation update from Secretary Flynn, and an update on rivers, dams, water, and wastewater systems from Secretary Moore. In the last few days, I've visited many communities throughout Central Vermont and the Northeast Kingdom. And while we have a lot of work ahead of us, I want to thank local officials and volunteers who have again taken on extra responsibility to lead their communities through yet another difficult time. Deputy Commissioner Batesy will go into more detail in a moment about what the SCOC is working on, but, but I want to reiterate, our team is doing everything we can to get you what you need and cut through the red tape whenever possible. Over the weekend, we submitted a request for a joint preliminary damage assessment from FEMA, which will determine if the state qualifies for a federal major disaster declaration. And if we do, we'll then need to make a formal request. If that is approved, we'll receive federal support for communities to repair public infrastructure. And separately, if there's enough damage and we meet the threshold, homeowners and renters in that county will receive individual assistance. I know it's difficult for many who are dealing with flooded homes to think about anything other than taking care of your families. But as I've said before, it's really important to report your damage to 211. It's essential for us to know the total impact to help FEMA make this individual assistance determination. If your house, basement, or garage flooded, if you have any damage to your home or property as a result of the storm, and that includes driveways, equipment, and vehicles, it's pretty broad. Please report it to 211. You may not think you need the help, but by reporting your damage, you're helping your neighbors. Because in order for a county to receive individual assistance, they need to make, meet a certain threshold. So please call 211 to report your damage. There's been a few questions about the state of emergency, so I thought I'd recap. As you remember, last July, I declared a state of emergency the day before the rain began, which was still in effect at the start of this storm. So when the flood hit last week, I amended that state of emergency to make clear it extended to this storm as well. And over the weekend, under those emergency powers, I authorized regulatory relief to expedite our response in a few key areas, like flood debris removal, accessing gravel and stone for road repairs, and making sure supplies could get to where they needed to go. You can expect more relief and exemptions to be announced in the coming days as we continue to assess and respond to the needs of Vermonters. We understand some towns are in need of immediate funds to make repairs, so I've asked my team to look at funding in the pipeline and expedite payments. This includes things like the Agency of Transportation State Highway Aid Program. They'll be issuing nearly 30 million to municipalities, sending towns their grant award for the year rather than quarterly, so they can put those funds to use for flood repairs right away. And even though it's been a few days since the storm, many are still mucking out their homes, repairing damage, and fixing driveways. As we've seen time and time again, Vermonters are resilient and have proven their willingness to step up to help their neighbors. I've heard many stories over the last few days about towns coming together and organizing volunteer efforts to help their community. We all have a role to play, so check on your neighbors, help muck out their basement, move some debris, or offer to pick up supplies. Even a few hours can make a big difference for someone who's been at it a while, especially in this heat. 
Again, I want to remind Vermonters to call 211 to report any damage which, which will help us build the case to qualify for federal support. So with that, I'll turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Dan Beatsy. Dan. Thank you, Governor. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Batesy, uh, Deputy Commissioner from the Department of Public Safety. Uh, the operations surrounding the 10 July flooding have shifted out of a life safety posture and are now focused on the challenging work of recovery. Uh, our Swiftwater teams are taking this opportunity to stand down, rest, and refit after an exhausting week of what we can call a heroic work. Uh, and now the recovery teams of Vermont Emergency Management will step in to take on their role. Uh, while the phase of response has changed, our readiness has not been lowered, and we remain prepared to address any new challenges that come along. The National Weather Service is carefully monitoring several thunderstorms predicted for late Thursday into Wednesday. Uh, and while these storms are not anticipated to approach the level of destruction that the previous storm did, uh, they do possess the capability to produce high winds, limited flash flooding, and cause local power outages. Uh, Vermont's large rivers are still high, but the predicted rainfall is not expected to cause them to exceed their banks or cause widespread flooding. Our teams will continuously monitor those conditions and be prepared if the situation changes. Significant heat and humidity are a more immediate concern for us in the next few days. A dangerous heat index poses a risk for those working outside and to anyone who's unable to access cooling resources. For those who are working on cleanup, please start early when it's cool, take frequent breaks, and be mindful to stay hydrated. Please also watch out for your neighbors, particularly those who are vulnerable to the effects of heat and humidity. I wanted to give you an update on some of our damage reporting, uh, especially around our 211 data. As of this morning, we've had uh, approximately 1,500 reports of flood related damage that have come into 211. These reports range from minor flooding to major structural damage. Emergency management is also assisting businesses and farms to report damage. We've received a little over 100 of those such reports. Since Thursday, uh, there have been 50 homes reported as uninhabitable. Now, I want to be clear that the definition is subjective to the reporter, so we can't say that those homes are still uninhabitable or that everyone in those 50 homes has necessarily been displaced. We are encouraged that the shelter census has continued to stay low and drop, um, and our teams are managing each of those families and each of those reports, and in fact, any team, any person that reports a need for immediate assistance is reaching a high touch management level. We are aware of some reported difficulties in reaching 211, uh, especially in areas of high volume utilization, and we're actively working to correct those problems. Uh, but as of this morning, there are no backlog calls to 211, and the current turnaround time from a message left at 211 to a callback is averaging less than an hour. If you encountered a difficulty in reporting damage or calling 211, please try again. Uh, I'll reemphasize that it is exceptionally important for all damage to be reported. I also want to mention what we're doing in the Emergency Operations Center. Uh, our EOC remains active. Uh, our regional coordinators are visiting effective communities uh, and doing their best to ensure that the local needs are matched with the full force and capability of state and federal resources. As we have done throughout the incident, we continue to encourage local emergency management directors to reach out whenever assistance is needed. We are available 24 hours a day and are eager to assist. Our Department of Public Safety inspectors continue their efforts in hard hit communities as well. To date, they've conducted 228 electrical, structural, and general safety inspections on homes and businesses damaged by the storm. Their efforts are ongoing and they'll continue until uh, as long as necessary. Vermont emergency management recovery teams are also actively engaged in assisting communities. Their work will coordinate with local, uh, existing local and state recovery infrastructure and assist Vermonters with the next steps of managing the crisis. 
One of their most important goals, and as the governor mentioned a moment ago, is the, the damage assessment requested through the Federal Emergency Management Agency to determine if Vermont qualifies for a public assistance disaster declaration. This assessment will be done in Addison, Orleans, Washington, Caledonia, Chittenden, Lamoille, Orange, and Essex counties. Emergency management has also requested a damage assessment to determine if Vermont qualifies for individual assistance disaster declaration. We'll do that, we'll conduct that assessment in Washington and Caledonia counties with the idea that it may expand as more reports come in. The most important step in achieving these thresholds for federal assistance is to clearly document flood-related damage. This underscores the need for everyone to report flood-related problems. What impacted people and communities should be doing at this time? There are several steps that residents and communities can take to assist the process of recovery. The first and most important is to document your damage. Take photographs, video, uh, as you proceed, save any documentation of expenses you have uh, incurred during cleanup. Report your damage to 211 and to your insurance company. You can use the online form for 211 at vermont211.org. You can simply call 211. And even if you're uh, expecting to fix that damage yourself, please document and call, make that report. If you haven't already started cleaning up, please do so. Start cleaning up immediately. We want to prevent the impact of mold and the ongoing problems of leaving water in, uh, uh, in your home. Um, if you need assistance in cleaning up, call 211. Through that source, we can direct you to the Crisis Cleanup Line. This is a, a web-based platform that enables you to request help cleaning out. You can also call Crisis Cleanup directly. Uh, that number is 802-242-2054. You can also go to crisiscleanup.org. We're asking as you clean up that you move the debris to the right of way. Communities will communicate a local plan for picking up that debris. But we also want to note that our emergency management teams are working with those communities to provide them reimbursement resources for that debris pickup and also to help with technical capabilities of picking the debris up as well. For community leaders, we ask you to continue to use your emergency management director to communicate the needs of your community to us. We want to help, but we obviously need to know where resources are needed. To the average Vermonter and, and to the people out there, we want to say please remain vigilant and be safe. Uh, the weather is improved and it looks like it's going to be a nice weekend. But please remember that the waters are still high, the currents are still swift, and flood contamination does pose a risk to you. So be mindful of all of those things as you approach bodies of water. Please do not enter flood waters and observe all posted road signs, detours, and do not put yourself in a dangerous position. As we shift to recovery, we know too well that we need to band together uh, to overcome this crisis. Once again, we're called upon to help one another and look after those who cannot help themselves. The Department of Public Safety has asked our first response agencies, fire departments, EMS services, and law enforcement agencies to help us identify people in need. Uh, you may see one of these blue 211 flyers being circulated out among uh, the communities by those first responders. Uh, they contain information uh, on 211, including a QR code, the website, and of course the 211 number. Uh, that we can be used to assist people who need help. And we're hoping that those agencies, as well as our community members, can utilize those to, uh, to make sure that we're connecting resources to those who need them the most. These flyers will also be available at our, de our Department of Health's offices of local health, and those will be in St. Johnsbury, Burlington, Morristown, Barrie, and White River Junction locations. They also will be available at uh, the Barry Fire Department as well as uh, Williston Fire Department and St. Johnsbury Fire Department. Um, and again, if anybody wants one, we'll be happy to provide you uh, yourself. Uh, if you'd like to volunteer to help your neighbors, uh, more help is always needed. To volunteer, you can register at www.vermont.gov forward slash volunteer. 
and there are also certainly many local volunteer opportunities to assess with flood victims. Please check with your local municipalities for those ongoing efforts. Cash donations can also be made to Vermont Communities Foundation's Flood Response Recovery Fund, and they can be made online at vtfloodresponse.org. I'll be available for questions later, uh, and I'll now turn it over to Secretary Flynn. Thank you, Commissioner Batesy. Good morning. Um, I started this uh, last week by telling you there were 54 Vermont state roads closed, and I believe on Friday reported to you there were 18. This morning I am happy to report that that number is now down to 12, and that number 12 includes eight bridges which have caused the road to close. I'll go through the list of those that are closed. Uh, Route 2 in Plainfield, which is due to a bridge. This is new. Route 2 in East St. Johnsbury, we closed last night due to a bridge. Route 5 in Barnet, uh, two sites that have bridges. Route 12 in Wrightsville. Route 17 in Addison. Route 17 also in Faston. And Route 17 in the Bristol Starksboro area due to a bridge. Route 100 in Duxbury, which is a bridge. Route 100B in Moortown, also a bridge. And now Route 102 in Canaan, which is a bridge. And the last is Route 302 in Groton, which you had great coverage on um, at the intersection of 232. The Lamoille Valley Rail Trail. I'll list what's closed and what's open. It would seem intuitive that it's the opposite of what's closed, but you have to remember from last year, we still have one section closed, and that's not intended to open until September 15th of this year. So for closures as of this storm, the Danville Village Trailhead to the West Danville Park and Ride, the Hardwick Trailhead to Wolcott Trailhead. And from last year, as I said, the trail is closed from East Hardwick to Greensboro Bend. We did, as I think I said on Friday, discover a fairly large area that was washed out in the West Danville area. We are hopeful that the repairs to that may coincide with our goal to open the entire trail by September 15th of this year, but that remains to be seen. To clarify the portions that are open, Swanton to Cambridge Junction, St. Johnsbury to Danville, Walden Heights to Hardwick Depot, now moving to active rail. Yesterday, Genesee and Wyoming reopened the St. Lawrence and Atlantic, which had nine places that were washed out between Norton and Island Pond. So that is now reopened. The Washington County Railroad on the Connecticut River line remains closed from Newport to Barnet. That may still be a week or a week and a half. Barry to Montpelier is open for limited rock movement to facilitate material for repairs. The Vermont Railway, I believe I mentioned Friday, had reopened on the Western Corridor, and that is the Ethan Allen, the Amtrak Ethan Allen. The New England Central Railroad, which is the Amtrak Vermonter line, remains closed, including freight from NECR and that may be a week, week and a half as well. Public transit is all back up and running and the US Route 2 commuter is using detour. Um, and then obviously once that bridge on Route 2 is open, it will go back to its regular schedule. 
I would like to talk to about something we did last year after the July flooding and we've once again moved to modify Vermont's vehicle incentive programs to help residents whose personal vehicles were damaged by last week's flooding. The intention is to provide financial support for Vermonters who were affected by the flooding. So with that, effective today, the Replace Your Ride program, which provides up to $5,000 for swapping a gas or diesel powered vehicle for cleaner transportation, will increase program eligibility to include flood damaged vehicles regardless of their age and whether they are currently drivable or not. Vehicles will still have to meet other program guidelines. The incentive program for new plug-in electric vehicles, which currently provides up to $5,000 for a new purchased or leased plug-in electric vehicle, will provide an additional $1,000 incentive so now totaling $6,000 to eligible Vermonters replacing flood damaged vehicles. And the Mileage Smart program, the state's high efficiency used vehicle program, which provides up to 25% of a vehicle's purchase price, of a vehicle's price, will automatically provide a full $5,000 incentive to Vermonters replacing flood damaged vehicles. Program participants may use these programs that I've described to bundle different state incentives. For up to a total of $11,000 off the price of a new plug-in electric vehicle and $10,000 off the price for a used plug-in electric vehicle. And you also may get local utility rebates and federal tax credits. So at this point, I too will remain available for questions and I would turn it over to Secretary Julie Moore. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, as you might expect in the immediate aftermath of most flood events, the Agency of Natural Resources receives numerous calls and inquiries about dredging local rivers, pursuing large scale removal of accumulated rocks, logs and sediment to help mitigate against future flooding. And make no mistake, because many towns and village centers are built along rivers here in Vermont, dredging is an important river management tool necessary to reduce future flood damage to roads and homes, bridges and businesses. In fact, following last summer's floods, the agency approved more than 400 next flood measures, including dozens in the last week which include activities like dredging and stream bank stabilization needed to maintain critical channel capacity and protect infrastructure. While dredging is a tool, an important tool even, it is also one that comes with significant risk and so needs to be used thoughtfully. Vermont has more than 7,000 miles of rivers and streams and how we treat our waterways that flow through our communities has real implications for and can present real risk to each of us as well as those who live downstream. So I want to be clear, dredging will not solve flooding, but it is a tool to help alleviate flooding in certain circumstances. The reason the agency provides technical assistance and regulatory oversight of in-stream work is that dredging needs to be done strategically so as not to further destabilize rivers ahead of the next flood. Without thinking about the whole river system, an approach that may better protect your property could have catastrophic consequences for your neighbors. And even though it may seem a little out of place as ANR Secretary to stand here and say this, our approach to managing dredging and in-stream work is not about fish habitat or water quality. It's about public safety. I've heard from many Vermonters over the past week to say nothing of the past year who reached out to share their experience living along our rivers. Many have shared memories of family members or their town regularly removing gravel from waterways or reported that they've lived for decades along a particular river or stream without having experienced a flood, but suffered several flood events in the last decade or even the last year. Clearly, they say, something has changed. 
I would offer several things have changed. First and foremost, our climate. Make no mistake, we are seeing more frequent and more intense storms and storms that drop more rain. Second, we've also changed our approach to how we live with waterways. Our predecessors used big yellow machines and dynamite to relocate our rivers out of the way and to the valley edge and then pin them in place and confine them to their channels by building berms and flood walls. But with our changing climate, this is no longer a sustainable approach, if it ever was. Make no mistake, the agency agrees that we need more capacity for flood waters in ways that reduce the sort of catastrophic damage we've experienced during recent events. And the most effective way to have room for our flood waters is by setting aside and restoring places for waters to spread out as opposed to digging deeper. By creating intentional spaces for rivers to spill out onto their floodplains, it will allow flood waters to slow down, drop sediment and debris, ideally in safe, unpopulated areas. To be clear, reconnecting and recreating floodplains takes time and money and does not obviate the need for targeted in-stream work. So we are permitting next flood measures while we are also continuing to improve floodplain access. Perhaps the best known example of floodplain reconnection is the Water Street Park in Northfield, where FEMA buyouts were executed for more than a dozen flood impacted residents following Tropical Storm Irene. Tens of thousands of cubic yards of material were removed from the floodplain, and a flood resilient community park was established that has been inundated with flood waters multiple times in the seven years since it opened. More recently, ANR partnered with the Vermont River Conservancy and other local partners in Brattleboro to reconnect a 12 acre site along the Whetstone Brook to its floodplain, excavating more than 400 dump truck loads of sediment and rocks. This project is projected to significantly reduce downstream flood elevations. And I was pleased to read earlier this week that the city of Mount Pillar and Preservation Trust of Vermont are looking at opportunities near the confluence of the Stevens Branch and the Winooski River near the Berlin Mount Pillar line on the home farm property for a significant floodplain restoration project. Shifting gears, I'm going to provide brief updates on Vermont's water infrastructure as well as related to state parks. The dam safety program continues to receive information from dam owners, um, particularly they are focused on the status of high hazard dams and dams that were damaged in last year's flood. To date, team members have visited over 20 dams um, and I am pleased to report they've seen very limited damage. Drinking water program staff continue to work with systems with mechanical and structural damage to restore and repair public drinking water systems. Currently, there are six boil water notices that are active. This includes three separate areas in Barnet and three separate areas in Plainfield. Boil water notices in Barrie and St. Johnsbury have been recently lifted. In terms of wastewater, there are two wastewater treatment facilities that are still impacted by the floods, Plainfield and Richmond. Both systems are functional, however, they sustain significant structural damage. Operations have resumed fully at Barton, Hardwick, and Linden, and currently we believe all other wastewater systems in Vermont are operational. Our team is continuing to work with impacted towns and facilities on long-term solutions. Our geology team has received more than 10 reports of flood-related landslides. New landslide and flood-related erosion reports include sites in Barton, Elmore, Jonesville, Linden, as well as many areas of concern from last summer in Plainfield that appear to have reactivated as a result of last week's rain. There are also reports of homes that were undercut by streams in Ferrisburg and Faiston, and the team is in the field daily this week conducting site visits and supporting landowners in evaluating next steps. Our Waste Management Division continues to monitor the situation and is prepared to offer support to Vermonters who may have experienced spills. Please report spills of oil, fuel, or other hazardous materials as a result of flooding by calling 802-828-1138. Our River Management Engineers and support staff continue to provide direct technical assistance to VTRANS, town road crews, and private landowners in flood, flood impacted communities. 
If you have questions about managing a river or stream on your property, please contact a DC River engineer before you begin any work. Their contact information, along with other flood resources, are available on our website, anr.vermont.gov slash flood. And finally, state parks. State parks are in the recovery phase, and thankfully, over the weekend, contractors began work in some of our hardest hit facilities um, concentrated in, in the Groton State Forest Parks. However, several remain closed. These include Boulder Beach, Ricker Pond, Stillwater, and Sayon Lodge. In addition, parks in Waterbury Center and Maidstone have reduced operations and limited parking due to high water conditions and overly wet ground. Please keep in mind, even as the parks themselves reopen, travel in and around these areas may be difficult due to current local road conditions. I encourage you to check trail, the Trail Finder website as well as the State Parks website for the latest information on camping, hiking, and swimming closures. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Governor Scott. Thank you, Secretary Moore. We'll now open it up to questions. Governor, do you know if anybody that applied for buyouts last year, has anybody been granted those or have any properties been bought out in the last year? Um, Looking for. I have some information on that. As I understand it from Vermont Emergency Management, there are 57 properties that are currently in FEMA review and one buyout that was awarded last week. So those buyouts are happening and they, will, they are in process through Vermont Emergency Management and FEMA. And if folks are interested in a buyout, especially if they were flooded in 23, they should contact their municipality. If they are flooded this time around, we're waiting for that federal declaration. So hopefully that helps you. Yeah, I mean, given like the destruction that we saw last summer, I mean, does this 57 seem low? I mean, there was an entire north side of Barry, Montpelier, other, you know, Johnson. Like, is that number high or low, would you say? Well, I. I can't compare it with other numbers. I know there are 22, 20 to 22 active buyouts in the city of Barrie alone that are in process. So that may be low, absolutely, when we look at the extent of the damage. And keeping in mind, buyouts are voluntary. The owner must be willing to proceed with a, with a buyout. And there is funding now, again, for 23, and we're waiting on 24. The other thing that I think is important for folks who may be considering a buyout to understand is if you participate in this buyout in 23, it's the appraisal of your property the day before the flood that you will receive. Whereas subsequent rounds of FEMA funding related again to 23 may be an appraisal the day you seek that buyout. So there is an incentive. And municipalities are the ones who will decide to grant the buyout. And they have to weigh a number of factors. How frequently was this property flooded? The severity of the property? river adjacency, things of those of that nature, as well as grand list impact. Um, but it could be argued the grand list impact happened the day the property flooded. Those properties are going to decrease in value over time. So that's another important consideration for a property owner. This is probably for Secretary Flynn. I know the state's been watching uh, a section of Route 2 in Plainfield, the landslide that's been getting bigger. Uh, I know there was talk about potentially shifting Route 2 if that got worse. It looks like it might have got worse. Any idea on what's going to happen with that? I actually was there yesterday. Uh, Commissioner Morrison and I took a little bit of a tour of some sites, and that was one area that um, I paused to, to look at. and then. At the intersection, I also met with uh, Kelly Ewald. She, Ewald. She is our geotech expert here at AOT. And if you look at that site, you'll see some uh, like black pipes in the ground, and that's monitoring movement. I was not told that it's moved as a result of last week's storm, but I will tell you that we have to do something more permanent as a result of last summer's storm. But the monitoring is important to help us understand what needs to be designed for that site. Thank you. 
Uh, was there any uh, drawdown in any of the dams in anticipation of the storm? As I understand, I'm going to let uh, Secretary Moore answer this one. But uh, as I understand it, uh, Waterbury is the only one that, with the opportunity to draw down. Uh, the others uh, don't have that ability. Wrightsville does not. Eastbury does not. Um, but what about uh, Marshfield? Uh, Marshfield, I don't believe, does either. But Secretary Moore can probably answer that better than I can. Sure. Uh, as the governor said, both Wrightsville and Eastbury facilities are passive, meaning we have no operational control over those facilities. Uh, the Waterbury Reservoir has a very specific operating protocol, and we trigger um, different levels of operation of the gates based on flows we're observing in the Winooski River in order to minimize any downstream flooding impacts. Those are the three state-owned and operated flood control facilities. The facility at Molly's Falls is actually owned and operated by Green Mountain Power. Um, they do have the ability to do drawdowns. We've been in close communication with both GMP and Morrisville Water and Light throughout the event um, and know that they were following forecasts closely and operating their facilities accordingly. So did you draw down any water in Walker? We did not, but we did close the floodgates, uh, which is part of the reason Waterbury Center State Park is currently closed. Uh, water levels rose in that facility, I believe, on the order of 10 feet as a result of the, the rain we received last week. And how far up do you go to get to the spillway? Uh, we were less than halfway to the spillway, and gates have reopened um, over the weekend as water levels in the Winooski River dropped and are starting to, to go back down. Could you give us a sense of uh, how preliminary damage reports to 211 compare to uh, 2023? Yeah, interesting you should ask that. I asked the same question in our briefing this morning. So I, we don't have that information. Uh, at our fingertips, but um, but I know Eric is going to be working on that uh, this week, so we can have a comparison to what you know what we experienced last year. So is Amtrak closed from Springfield to St. Albans? Correct. Yes. 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 It will uh, be for another week or ten days. It will be until Genesee and Wyoming gets the line open in in Middlesex. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Question about the health of the lake. Uh, last summer we were told that the flooding, all the nutrients and chemicals would affect the lake for years to come with legacy phosphorus and whatnot. What do you see this flood, uh, what effect this will have on that as well? Uh, certainly it, it exacerbates the, the concerns we saw last summer. Uh, we know based on monitoring data that the amount of sediment and phosphorus that reached the lake during the, the week immediately following the July storms approached that which we might see in an average year. Uh, I suspect just having looked at the Winooski every day for the last week, um, we will see similar statistics this year. Um, particular to the Winooski, it may not be as widespread as it had been. Um, and certainly have received uh, anecdotal reports from lakeshore property owners that, that in some ways they believe the lake has, has never looked worse. Um, this is a concern for us as climate change is going to continue um, to cause more intense and more significant wet weather events. Um, and our water quality, clean water goals for Lake Champlain um, need to be achieved regardless of climate change. Um, and so we are actively looking at that data, seeing what it tells us about long-term trends, and we'll ultimately uh, consider if there are changes needed in our management approach. Um, but a lot of the, the practices and strategies we're using, from improving stormwater management to working with farmers and foresters on conservation practices, um, we know are the right things. We know the work we've done on municipal roads in partnership with VTRANS paid some significant dividends during this storm, and it, it may be a question as much as anything about the pace of our activity as opposed to the types of projects we're pursuing. Given that Lake Champlain is arguably one of the biggest economic drivers in the state, as you mentioned, phosphorus comes from a lot of different areas. We talk about buyouts of like flooded homes per se, but what about farms? I mean, should we be looking at farms that continually flood and input nutrients into our watershed? We've actually uh, had a very successful initiative in that space that's ongoing for the past several years. 
uh, with funding from the Lake Champlain Basin Program and the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Fish and Wildlife at ANR has uh, been working with farmers to look at, buy out, look at and pursue buyouts of marginal farmland. And that's farmland that, that repeatedly floods, makes it challenging often for those landowners to take off a, a good crop. Um, and we've seen, I think at this point, over a thousand acres of marginal farmland um, purchased by Fish and Wildlife using these federal dollars um, with the wetlands actively being restored at this point. Um, there's some really great graphics we've produced regarding how that's benefited not just water quality, um, but frankly flood resilience in Middlebury, which is, has the benefit of being downstream of where these wetland projects are, are being concentrated at the moment. On a different subject, uh, Governor, the property tax increase that is coming is, what's the time frame of that? It's whatever the, the towns um, decide when they send out their property tax bills. I would, yeah, I would expect uh, that would be yeah. sometime soon. Is That's the average, 13.8% average. Average. It can range from um, some communities actually, because of the per pupil, pupil, uh, per pupil weighting um, that was implemented, uh, could actually see a lesser amount than they paid last year, um, but all the way up to maybe 30%. 30 percent. 30 percent property tax increase, increase in some right, towns, in some towns, like the richer towns. Probably, I, I think. Uh, I'm just going by recollection. Uh, Killington is going to receive a fairly substantial increase, as I recall. And do you have a projection of? Next year, is this going to continue? Um, without um, changing uh, anything, uh, I would expect that we we would see an increase. Um, I don't know if it's the same magnitude, but we would still see an increase in December. What, what word do you use? Significant increase, or I'd say significant, right? I mean, it's it's just we can't continue without structural reforms in education. Um, we can't expect this to fix itself. Um, there is a the legislature put into effect a, a task force that I think has started meeting maybe this week. Uh, but this study group um, is just going to forward some of probably I would expect and maybe forward uh, some of the recommendations we've made over the last eight years, and uh, and then they'd have to vote them into place. Um, so this isn't going to I I don't see any path forward where this is going to. Uh, immediately fix the situation for this next year. And the lack of funding for capital improvements or the reduction of funding for capital improvements, is that going to continue? Um, well, we... For education. Uh, for education. Well, we have a, a capital program um, with the state, the legislature, um, that um, that continues. We, uh, I would assume the recommendation will be to continue to tighten that um, so that we aren't borrowing as much. Um, it's not lost on me uh, over the last number of years, um, probably for the last 20 years. Um, our debt uh, payment uh, per year uh, exceeds the amount of money we borrow. Uh, so this is something that impacts us. Uh, that's why we wanted to move towards uh, using more cash instead of borrowing money. Um, we put something in place, but um, but even that uh, took a bit of a hit in the last legislative session. So places like Woodstock that canceled their improvement process that they were going to do because they lacked a new, a new piece of legislation reduced the funding availability for them. Well, it's on the it's on the school districts at this point, um, even though. Uh, Burlington moved forward with a fairly significant bond, uh, and they approved that locally. Um, we did uh, put forward, I think they received over, it seemed like we gave them five or six million dollars because of the PCBs to move into their uh, temporary location, and then I think that they received another ten million dollars for, for PCB 16. remediation. Sixteen? Sixteen million. Uh, for remediation for PCBs, which is impacting a number of other schools uh, throughout Vermont. Governor, as, as you're starting to build your budget for the next year, are we are you still taking into account the federal match for some of last year's flood money 
And what are you expecting? I mean, I guess we don't know. People are still reporting damage, right? Yeah. But like, what, what are you expecting this to have? Or what effect this will have on this year's budget? Yeah, I'm Next year's. going to be meeting uh, with the, the economists uh, uh, today, uh, as a matter of fact, later on. Uh, to see where we're going to end up uh, for this year. But I would expect uh, there may be some surplus uh, that uh, automatically will go into uh, pensions. Half of it will go into pensions. Anything over and above will go into pensions and then into the uh, general fund reserves. Um, but I would expect uh, we are going to need more match money uh, for next year. We're all set for this year, uh, but we'll need more match money for next year. Oh, sorry. How big of a surplus? I don't don't know at this point. Um, I'll know more this afternoon. Is the e-board meeting today? No. Oh, okay. No, this is just with uh, a meeting with myself and our administration with the economists. Um, also on that topic of you know next year's budget. Um, speaking of buyouts, uh, Digger had a great story about a Barry couple that sought a buyout and was denied by the city. Mm -hmm. because City is uh, very concerned about its brand list. This is something I also talked to the city manager about. And I'm wondering if you think it will be necessary, appropriate um, for the state to start directly funding buyouts so that there is not this tension between municipalities and homeowners who want a buyout um, because municipalities are worried about their brand list, etc. Yeah, there is a Buyouts are complicated um, because you're dealing with FEMA, you're dealing with uh, the owner, and you're dealing with the local municipality. And all have to agree um, before a buyout moves forward. So um, I think there are some hard and fast rules in terms of buyouts that I think we would ask the federal government to, to take a look at. Uh, one of them is once you there's a buyout, you can't build there again. And there's no, and, and I understand the resistance with some of the municipalities because that's the bread and butter. That's that's part of the grand list. So uh, that's they need the income as well. And it's not as though Barry was flush with money before all the flooding hit. And to take some of those off the tax rolls is going to be difficult. Um, so there's got to be something we can do in between. So we're. We're cognizant of that. Uh, we're going to need some federal help in, in terms of changing the formula a bit, um, maybe uh, to to allow for everything, uh, protecting protecting the communities from flooding in the future, um, but also protecting uh, the communities from uh, financial issues. So we're we're looking at that as we speak. We're looking at before this last flood. I don't know that FEMA is known for being particularly flexible about its rules. How likely do you think that, you know, how likely do you think it'll be that they're actually going to bend on something like that? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if FEMA themselves can make uh, this decision. All their funding comes from Congress. Uh, all their changes in the methodology comes from Congress. So um, as we've seen, Congress is uh, uh, not easy to deal with either. Uh, so, and they're not uh, exactly getting everything done that needs to be done. But I would expect that this impacts more than just Vermont and many more other states. So, you know, we'll work at this um, and come up with something that maybe will work for everyone, uh, but we'll have to have some help on the congressional side. All right, well, we move to the phones. I'm Wallace Allen. Seven days. Oh, oh. Hey, meet me. Go meet me. Go ahead. Um, can I go back to that question of um, a long-term strategic plan for uh, managing some of the watersheds, like the Winooski River watershed? Because it seems like the same areas keep getting hit over and over, and a lot of people are asking me questions. You know, with somebody taking, is there some government? Um, is there some state group? that is forming or, you know, are some people dedicated to this idea of, um, of a major long-term plan for these areas that are obviously um, going to continue to be very problematic? And especially because in some cases, towns spent a lot of money repairing roads that were washed out again and bridges that were washed out again this summer. And, you know, it looks 
probable that it's going to happen every year. Pat or Julie? I can start maybe, Governor. Um, so we, there are several different initiatives underway, and we'll uh, let Pat then maybe put some, some meat on, on the bones. But included in the state's FY25 budget is match money. Um, that now we need federal, the federal government to act through reauthorizing the Water Resources Development Act that would help fund a Wodnewski River Basin study. Um, in particular, it would focus some efforts on the, those two passive flood control facilities at Wrightsville and East Barry to see if there are ways we could actually gain a degree of control over their operations and reduce future flood damage. In addition, um, there is an initiative being led by uh, some of the regional planning commissions in conjunction with funding from VHCB and others to look at specific resilience projects, um, particularly flood impacted communities could implement uh, to reduce future vulnerabilities. It doesn't seem as though addressing problems or addressing those two dams is going to help people upstream. No, I, I, I think that that's a, a fair assessment and that's in some ways where the, the very projects, the, these uh, resilience projects come in. Uh, I think the, the opportunity to build the kind of flood control facilities that were constructed after the 1927 floods, which is where Eastbury, Wrightsville, and Waterbury all uh, find their origin story, is, is probably um, virtually impossible at this point. Um, but uh, I think there are ways to, to make sure we're taking full advantage of the facilities we do have, and then it will be um, other strategies that are needed to reduce flood vulnerabilities uh, that can't be um, suitably mitigated through use of those flood control facilities. Um, how much money is in the FY25 budget for this? 250000 For the study. Right? For the state. For this, yeah. Uh, 250,000 that the state will match for, for that, that study. But, um, and I'm neglected to introduce myself. I'm Pat Moulton. I'm the Central Vermont Re flood, Re flood Recovery Officer. And I would just add, as Secretary Moore had indicated, with the home farm property uh, around the roundabout in, is that Berlin or still uh, Montpelier? Anyway, that, that and several other properties along the watershed, in the Winooski watershed, are being analyzed for possible buyout, possible reconnection to the river, to reconnect floodplain, rather, to the river. And that's really what's going to help us mitigate flood damage in the long term is, and as the Secretary said, taking a look watershed by watershed, where do you get the big, biggest bang for the buck in terms of what's going to actually help reduce water flow, slow the river down, reduce flooding downstream. And that starts at the headwaters, whether it's in Cabot for the Winooski, and goes all the way through the watershed. And these are processes that take time. It's just like buyouts. They take time. It's not immediate. But it's also an important factor for municipalities to look at as they consider hazard mitigation program grants that are coming up this fall. Uh, there's a date, uh, August 16th, that Vermont Emergency Management would like towns to let them know what those projects are. And they can be everything from buyouts to elevations. Elevating a home is another possible solution, as well as other kind of flood proofing methods that be, can be done around these buildings. But that reconnection of the river to its floodplain, as the Secretary explained, we can't armor these rivers um, out of our flooding. We've got to get out of their way. Water will go where it wants to go. And it's time for us to get more serious about that kind of activity. And that's what federal funds and these watershed studies are going to help us do. Thank you. Alrighty. How much? Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Down here, close to there's a lot of capacity for floodwaters, but I'm wondering two things. One, is that doing any good for central Vermont? Um, you know, if that capacity is, is able to be used. And the second, and um, Pat Moulton got into this a little bit, is how aggressive the state is going to be, um, say, in, in doing land taking and, or in buyouts and that sort of thing, which is also very expensive and, and controversial. And I'm, I'm sure you're getting into that now, but I'm wondering where that process is. I didn't hear, where did you say there was capacity? 
Tim. Uh, down down here in Richmond and Williston, you can see the flood waters filling the the uh, farmland and that sort of thing. But is that is that helping you in uh, Barry and upriver? Yeah, obviously, we all it all has to work together uh, throughout the whole river corridor uh, in order to be successful, both downstream and upstream. So, I think every little bit helps, and that's why. We've taken the approach uh, that uh, we want to increase the capacity throughout the whole entire corridor. And that's why we're having the study to help us determine where best to do that to protect uh, the most, uh, have the most effect. Anything you want to add to that? I was just, I was just wondering, Governor, as a follow up as to how aggressive the state would be, you know, if, if it came down to land taking and that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, that's a. Uh, that's a pretty high bar, and uh, we don't want to make that a common practice. Uh, however, um, if there is a section uh, that that makes all kinds of sense and and will alleviate uh, some of the flooding in uh, a, com a particular community, uh, we would explore that. But hopefully, uh, we could make some sort of deal before that comes into play. Those land takings, again, should be the last thing we do. All right, great. Thank you, Governor. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. All right, back to the room. The convention's going on right now in Milwaukee. I'm sure you're aware of. Nikki Haley will be speaking today. Wasn't originally supposed to speak to national. It's a reportance to help unify the party, if you will. You've publicly spoken out against Trump multiple times. I'm just guessing if we can just kind of get your reaction to last weekend, the pick for J.D. Vance, but then also this unity effort that they seem to be going to and bringing in the former ambassador, which you endorsed at one point. Yeah, well, I'm hoping this unity, talk of unity, um, is not just for the parties. Like, this unity should be our country, unifying. Uh, what we saw last weekend uh, with former President Trump, and I first want to extend my condolences and thoughts to the family uh, of the person who died. As a result, just attending a rally, a political rally, was killed, who dedicated his life uh, to giving back to, to his community, and two others who were severely injured. And President Trump, former President Trump, uh, came within an inch of possibly losing his life at a political rally. Um, this isn't, we should be better than this. Uh, this isn't what uh, our democracy is founded on. Uh, this was, our democracy was formed to avoid this type of thing. So it's incumbent upon all of us, uh, not just to unify political parties, but to unify our country. Uh, we can have political disagreements, but this isn't the way to solve them. So. We should take stock in that. Both parties, all parties, uh, should think about this as a point, a time, when we come together as a country and, and tone this down and, uh, and have our disagreements, but have them in a respectful and civil way. Governor, on the note of um, getting a federal disaster declaration, can you remind us of the, how that's calculated, whether that's based on dollars of damage reported or a number of people impacted? The yeah, there's a, there's a formula, different formula for the public assistance uh, versus the individual assistance. And I don't know if, who would be best to answer that. Eric, can you read that? So public assistance, there's two thresholds. One is the state level threshold, which is roughly 1.2 million. Uh, but then there is an individual threshold for each county. And it's the same with uh, the threshold for IA. It's not a specific dollar amount, but it's damage and how it impacts the, 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 local, um, the local municipalities. Okay. How close are we to meeting those thresholds? Do you know? Unofficially, on the PA side, we feel that we're significantly over that threshold. Um, we uh, put in our request for preliminary damage assessments based on our numbers, and we submitted for eight counties. And then on the IA side, the individual assistance side, we submitted for two counties, as uh, Deputy Commissioner Batesy said, because we felt that we're pretty confident. That does not mean that we can't add as we go, as we continue to collect data, uh, but those are ones that we felt very strongly about, so we wanted to get the process moving. Okay. Last year, the both the 
initial declaration was made, I think, the day of or the day immediately following the initial hit of the flood, and then President Biden kind of upgraded it to a major disaster declaration, I think, by this day last year. Why was that so fast in comparison to this year? Yeah, I think uh, the severity of the storm and some of what you reported on, I think that uh, FEMA, uh, the president, and everyone was watching what was happening in Vermont. It was catastrophic uh, and a great deal of damage. So it was, uh, uh, I think, the path forward uh, led them to expedite uh, their declarations as well, to sign those declarations. Um, but we're back in the regular process at this point in time uh, where it's going to take a little bit more time uh, than it did the last year. And Secretary Moore, we were talking a lot about buyouts. Am I mistaken? Doesn't the state have its own buyout program, too? I don't know, Eric, if you want to talk about it through the EM, the Flood Resilient Communities Fund? We do have a buyout program, um, and we're working with the legislation on creating a new one that allows us to take the uh, some individuals or some uh, properties that may not exactly fit into the FEMA requirements and use that money uh, to, to help those individuals. And would that, or does the existing state program and or a future program, would that have the same requirement to keep those spaces as green spaces, or could you rebuild on those? I'm asking because if this is the concern for towns um, that they can't take properties off the grand list, is there a state way to make our own rules, essentially? So the, the Flood Resilient Communities Fund really functions very similar to FEMA. It's, it's intended to be buyouts, and as, as Eric indicated, it, it's to work in spaces where FEMA um, buyouts uh, simply aren't available to those property owners. Uh, we do have some other types of programs, uh, less about infrastructure and more about river corridor protection, where we will purchase what we call channel management rights. Um, these are often most appropriate in agricultural settings or on large swaths of undeveloped land where essentially we reach an agreement with the landowner that they're not going to seek permission, a next flood measure to dredge or otherwise manipulate the stream channel and rather uh, give the river the freedom to move. They are welcome to use the land while it exists, but then if the river comes for it in a flood event, they also need to maintain a hands-off approach. Um, so we do have some other tools besides just these buyouts, um, but the, the, in general, those buyout dollars are about um, relocating a, a something that a particularly vulnerable structure or removing it outright. And we're talking about a fairly small amount of money as compared to some of the FEMA buyouts, um, probably under $10 million. Correct. I think yeah. it was under. under $10 million in the fund to start with. The oh, two. Oh, <laughs> yeah, um, you, you bring up a good point there <clears throat> with some interest last year um, by some municipalities to create a program that would allow municipalities to buy out uh, certain uh, properties, then enable them to redevelop them, but in a manner that would um, accommodate floodwaters to come and go out to make them flood resilient. It didn't uh, get over the finish line. It didn't really get out of the gate, to be honest. Um, but there's a few different uh, thoughts out there about that. And um, we, you know, I think as an administration would be interested in, in really digging in and seeing how we could make something like that work. Of course, there would have to be money to do that and, um, and a vehicle to do that. So um, again, I think as the governor mentioned, we, we have a housing shortage, and we have to look at every opportunity to keep more housing on, online, but we don't want it to just wash away and have people keep getting flooded. And, and I just want to clarify, I think when Secretary Curley said it didn't get out of the gate, I think that meant the legislative gate. I think it, our, it got out of our gate. Uh, the vehicle incentive programs you guys mentioned that will be adjusted, do you technically need legislative approval? or? I think, I think we're all... We've, Right. <clears throat> the legislature gave us that approval this last session to, uh, we did this last summer as part of the emergency area, but we obtained some authority this year in the transportation bill to be able to do that um, because they recognized, of course, the need for Vermonters. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Governor, with Congress being the way 
that it is, how much do you feel like this is just left on Vermont to take care of this ourselves? You mean as far as the flooding? Mm -hmm. um, no, I mean, we still need FEMA. We are going to get <coughs> receive a tremendous amount of help uh, through the normal process. Um, but there are areas like Barry uh, that I've talked about before uh, that we could use some more help um, in some of those hardest hit areas uh, that are complicated with, uh, you know, an economy uh, that uh, is in downturn in, in, that, in that area, has been over the last few decades. Um, a housing crisis uh, that was here long before the flood uh, that uh, continues uh, to, to impact us in negative ways. Um, for instance, we have people displaced uh, from their homes at this point in time. And FEMA themselves, uh, as you remember, their first, their first move is typically to rent facilities, to put people in. Uh, well, there isn't any rent capacity. There is no inventory in Vermont of any housing units. Uh, so that they went and move, we're going to move forward with the, uh, with the mobile homes and setting up a park and so forth. So we need to continue uh, to focus on the real problem here and we need more housing inventory to both lower costs uh, as well as to provide in these times when we need people who are displaced to have a place to go. Secretary Tebbets, I see you. Uh, could you give us an update on farms? And I'm sure it's early for any acreage estimations, but whatever you have. Sure. Um, Anson Tebbets, Agency of Agriculture. Um, early on, we are going to have significant damage. Um, you're going to have areas that are going to hit twice, maybe three times in the last year. Um, we are going to be putting out a, a survey, which we hope to launch pretty soon, to get the real economic impact of the damage. But early indications, um, you know, one example, I was at a potato farm this weekend, 40% damage uh, this year, same as last year. Um, you're gonna see um, the corn crop um, being damaged along, you know, Missiscoy, Winooski, Lamoille, same areas as last time. So feed for animals, um, there's some hope that it will bounce back uh, the weather's been a little bit better than it was last year. If we recall, last year it rained consistently all the time. Um, some of it wasn't flattened like last time. Um, so we'll have a better indication. Uh, 211 is giving us some initial data, and uh, they're in the business category, so we are seeing reports from farmers. So I suspect um, you know there's going to be some that hit uh, again. There are going to be some that were avoided this time, and then there's going to be some new ones. So that's an area. It's going to be a whole new game for those farmers that were not hit last time uh, that we'll need to pay attention to um, as well. Are you aware of any livestock deaths that happened? We have not heard of any uh, livestock uh, deaths at the agency. There could have been, but we have not heard of any at, at this time. What about timing for soil contamination testing? What's the timeline on that? One of our great partners is University of Vermont Extension Service. Um, and we've been talking with uh, them as well as our federal officials about those issues. I know UVM Extension along with our staff have been trying to meet and uh, discuss issues like that with as many farmers as we possibly can. So a lot of visits are going on talking about um, you know, contamination with the crop and like last year if we need to get to the point where we need to do more soil testing and seeing if the crops are okay, uh, we'll work with UVM Extension on that. As you've been visiting farms, what's, what are they telling you? How are they feeling? What's the attitude like? Um, I think this is a part, and we talked about this last week a little bit, um, it's pretty raw and the emotions are pretty raw. And uh, our mental health and stress, uh, you know, we're encouraging everyone to, um, you know, really um, reach out, talk with each other. Uh, it's, it's discouraging, you know, it was, we were headed in a great direction, I know, in Vermont. We had some really great crops that were really off to the races. The corn was doing well, vegetables were doing well, and it, again, uh, and who knows why, it, it hit on the same day. So I think it's, uh, you know, it's one foot in front of the other. 
Um, and boy, Vermonters are resilient, and they're going to, you know, do the best they can to get through it. And we'll be there to support them in any way we can. Thank you all very much. Thank you.